Welcome back to this next video in which we are discussing the thyroid gland. Okay, so to summarize where we've got to so far, we've seen that the thyroid gland is going to synthesize and secrete these two hormones, T3 triiodothyronine and T4 thyroxin, on a continuous basis, and it's going to try and maintain the amount of T3 and T4 in the bloodstream at a constant, non-fluctuating level. What we now want to see is firstly how are T3 and T4 transported around the bloodstream because most of them, uh, most of the T3 and T4 molecules within the blood are not free. Instead, they're bound to plasma proteins, and I just want to give you the names of those proteins which they bind to. Uh, then, what I want to talk about is broadly what are the actual functions of T3 and T4. We said that it's to maintain basal metabolic rate, uh, but what does that actually mean? Let's have some specific examples. Uh, and then what I want to do is go through how T3 and T4 actually affects the behavior of a single cell. So I want to go through the thyroid receptor and all of that. Um, and then I want to talk about in detail what are the actual uh, effects at different areas of the body. Okay, right, uh, so we'll begin with then the proteins that T3 and T4 bind to within the bloodstream. And in fact, I think it's probably best, or well, actually, no, it's not best to do it on that diagram. I was thinking I had space, but now I don't. Okay, so we've seen that the thyroid follicular cells are going to secrete the T3 and T4 into the bloodstream. And as I say, most of the T3 and T4 that is circulating in the bloodstream is not actually free. Instead, it is bound to uh, plasma proteins. And there are three plasma proteins which combine to thyroid hormones T3 and T4. One is a special one for binding to T3 and T4 proteins, which is the thyroid binding globulin, okay, uh, which uh, is usually abbreviated down to TBG. There is another second one which has uh, the role of specifically transporting T3 and T4, although it can also uh, transport some of the retinoids as well, and this is called transphyretin. So transphyretin. So you can see that the phi is for thyroid hormones, the retin is for the retinoids. So transphyretin is another protein that's in the bloodstream which can also transport the thyroid hormones T3 and T4 around the bloodstream along with thyroid binding globulin. And then there's one that can transport a whole plethora of different things around the bloodstream which is the protein albumin. Okay, so albumin can also bind to and transport T3 and T4 proteins around the bloodstream. So most of the T3 and T4 molecules, when they've been secreted by the thyroid gland into the blood, are going to be caught by these proteins, and these proteins will then deliver them all around the body, and they'll unbind from the protein and be able to go into the cells at the peripheral sites. Okay, so what I want to talk about now, and I think actually I'll do this first rather than summarizing what the effects of T3 and T4 on the body are, I'm going to talk now about when T3 and T4 arrives at a peripheral cell, how is it actually going to act on that peripheral cell? So I want to uh, talk about how does T3 and T4 change the behavior of cells, and then we'll talk about at different sites in the body, what is the actual change in behavior going to be. Okay, so uh, let's draw a peripheral cell then here, and I'll just get this nicely central. So let's have a big picture of a peripheral cell here. And what we now want to see is how is this cell going to respond to T3 and T4? What are the receptors for T3 and T4? What's the signaling pathway? Okay, now, well, there are four broad types of receptors. There are uh, G-protein coupled receptors, more fancy called seven transmembrane receptors. There is not a G-protein coupled receptor for T3 and T4, so that one's gone. There are ligand-gated ion channels. The receptor for T3 and T4 is not a ligand-gated ion channel. There are then the enzyme-coupled receptors, the most famous example which, of which are the receptor tyrosine kinases. The receptors for T3 and T4 are not uh, enzyme-linked receptors. Instead, they are nuclear receptors. And the way then that T3 and T4 are going to have an effect on um, a cell is by changing the gene expression within that cell, changing which genes are actually going to be uh, turned on and which are going to be turned off 
and all things in between. So changing gene expression is how T3 and T4 are going to change the behaviour of this cell. Okay, now before we actually get on to the thyroid receptor then, this nuclear receptor uh, that's going to uh, affect gene expression, what I want to mention is the fact that uh, I've mentioned before that T4 is the main one that the thyroid actually synthesizes. The ratio is about 90% of the thyroid hormone molecules that the um, thyroid actually releases into the bloodstream are going to be T4 and 10% are going to be T3. However, when you actually arrive at the tissue, a lot of the T4 molecules can be converted into T3 molecules. So again, the means by which T4 and T3 actually get into peripheral cells are not very well understood. Whether or not they just diffuse through the cell membrane, we don't really understand it. But they do get from the bloodstream into the peripheral cells. Okay, so this bit isn't very well understood, so I'm just skirting around that and drawing it as an arrow here. So they do indeed get from the bloodstream into the cell. Now, T3 is the more potent activator of the thyroid receptor, which I'll introduce you uh, to in a moment, but that's the nuclear receptor for these two. And what can happen is T4 can be converted now that it's inside the cytoplasm of this peripheral cell into T3. So there is a means to convert T4 into T3. So peripheral cells where uh, thyroid hormones are going to act can have an enzyme in them, okay? and I'm drawing this enzyme here in red, which can convert T4 to T3 just simply by chopping off uh, one of the iodines on that second B ring of the uh, T4 molecule. And this enzyme is known as a 5 prime, 3 prime deiodinase because it's going to remove an iodine either from the 5 prime carbon or from the 3 prime carbon, but of course they're utterly equivalent, so it really doesn't matter. But that's the name of this enzyme regardless. So it's called a 5 prime, 3 prime deiodinase. And there are two different types of 5 prime, 3 prime deiodinases. And this will become important later on, which is why I mention it. I only mention what I think is interesting and important. So uh, you will see later on why I'm mentioning this. Okay, it's not just accessory knowledge. It is something that will actually have an interesting consequence later on. Okay, so there are two types of 5 prime and 3 prime deiodinase enzymes. There is what we call type 1. 1 5 prime 3 prime deiodinase and there's what we call type 2 5 prime 3 prime deiodinase the type 1 5 prime 3 prime deiodinase you find this a lot in liver cells you find it a lot in kidney cells okay so those are some of the locations where you'll find type 1 5 prime 3 prime deiodinase enzymes whereas type 2 5 prime 3 prime deiodinase this is found a lot in the brain it's also found in importantly in the pituitary gland and we know that the pituitary gland is going to have a role in um, controlling the release of T3 and T4 so you will see that this is interesting later on but for now just take this as a fact that we will uh, see why we care about this later on. Okay, so there are these two different types of 5 prime, 3 prime deiodinase. They do the same thing, but they are fundamentally different enzymes with different uh, structures. Okay, so there is the type 1 5 prime, 3 prime deiodinase, which is majorly found in liver and kidney, and then there is the type 2 5 prime, 3 prime deiodinase, which is found in the brain and also very importantly in the pituitary gland. Okay, right, so these 5 prime, 3 prime deiodinase enzymes. They are going to convert T4 molecules that are arriving in this peripheral cell into T3 molecules, and now that means that, you know, we're going to end up with more T3 molecules than we would otherwise end up with. And now both these T4 and T3 molecules are now going to have an effect on the gene expression within the cell by affecting uh, a nuclear receptor. So now let's turn our attention to the actual thyroid receptor. So the nuclear receptor that responds to T3 and T4, it's called the thyroid receptor, and for short it's just abbreviated down to the TR, like so. So this is, is going to stand for the thyroid receptor. Okay, and this is going to be a nuclear receptor. So it's going to act as a transcription factor. However, it doesn't act as a transcription factor on its own. Instead, it functions as a dimer. 
and this is quite complicated uh, because it's not one of these ones that when the uh, molecule binds it then dimerizes and then binds the DNA. It's already bound to the DNA, but it's not doing anything before the T3 or T4 binds to it. So let me explain this. So starting right at the beginning then, thyroid receptor is going to actually act as a dimer with another protein. And to keep this nice and simple, I'll just show this like so. So here is uh, the thyroid receptor, TR, and the other transcription factor that it functions with is the retinoid X receptor, a very uh, famous transcription factor that you will probably heard of before. So this is the retinoid X receptor. The retinoid X receptor is a transcription factor which dimerizes with loads of other transcription factors, and together the two of them function as a transcription factor. Okay, so the thyroid receptor, to function, it has to dimerize with the retinoid X receptor. Okay, so the thyroid receptor with the retinoid X receptor, which together we'll call the thyroid receptor retinoid X receptor heterodimer, hetero meaning different, dimer meaning two-membered structure, uh, this heterodimer combined to specific um, sequences of organic bases, um, well, a specific sequence of organic bases. I don't know the specific sequence uh, of organic bases that this binds to, but it will usually between, be between 8 and 10 amino acids, and this heterodimer will specifically recognize that sequence of, um, sorry, not amino acids, of nucleic acids, and will bind to it. And all the genes which are going to have their expression influenced by the thyroid receptor, retinoid X receptor, heterodimer, they will have this specific sequence of amino acids in their gene control region, which is upstream of the gene. So let me now draw a picture of this. So if this is the DNA here, and let's say uh, this is a gene here, that is going to actually have its expression influenced by T3 and T4. And of course, not all genes are going to have their expression influenced by T3 and T4, just a handful, okay? So genes that are going to be influenced by the thyroid receptor, retinoid, X receptor, heterodimer then, they are going to have in the gene control region upstream of them a specific sequence that the thyroid receptor, retinoid, X receptor, heterodimer is capable of binding to, and this is known as the thyroid response element, or the TRE, like so. So this is the thyroid response element, and the thyroid response element, as I described to you previously, is just this sequence of between 8 and 10 nucleic acids that the thyroid receptor, retinoid, X receptor, heterodimer is capable of binding to. It's the specific sequence that this likes and binds to. So this thyroid receptor, retinoid, X receptor, heterodimer, it has a specific sequence of nucleic acids, and I don't, as I say, actually know what that specific sequence of nucleic acids is, but it will be between 8 and 10 nucleic acids, and wherever this sequence of 8 to 10 nucleic acids actually shows up in the genome, the thyroid receptor, retinoid, X receptor, heterodimers will bind to it. And this sequence is known as the thyroid response element, or the TRE. Okay, right, so... I've coloured that in in orange here then. So, genes then that are going to have their expression influenced by the thyroid receptor, retinoid, X receptor, heterodimer, will have this sequence, the thyroid response element, in their gene control regions upstream uh, of them. And what will happen then is the thyroid receptor, retinoid, X receptor, heterodimers will bind to those uh, thyroid response elements. And they do this long before any of the T3 or T4 has come in and bound. Okay, so they do this whether there's T3 or, and T4 coming into the cell or not. Okay, so here this is the heterodimer, so this is the thyroid receptor, retinoid, X receptor, heterodimer, and I'll just colour that in in orange here. Okay. But even though it's bound there, usually it does not have any effect on the, uh, or at least it doesn't have its normal effect on the downstream gene. So usually it doesn't have an effect on the downstream gene, and the reason is that what's going to bind here, on top of this, is another protein which is going to stop it actually functioning. And this is known as a co-repressor, and for short it's often written co-R like so.
So before the T3 and T4 arrive, then even though the thyroid receptor, retinoid, extraceptor, heterodimers are bound to the thyroid response elements upstream of these genes that are going to have their expression influenced by them, they don't actually do anything because they have a co-repressor bound on top of them. So here is this other protein, which is the co-repressor bound on top of them. Now, here comes um, what's going to happen with the T3 and T4. So T3 and T4 that have come inside the cell, they can go into the nucleus and they can bind to the thyroid receptor uh, of the thyroid receptor, retinoid, X receptor, heterodimer, and that will lead to changes in conformation which will cause the co-repressor to break off and will cause another protein, which is a co-activator, to come and bind on instead. Okay, so the co-repressor will be replaced by a co-activator, and co-A here is just short for co-activator, so this is now a co-activator protein. And now once that co-activator protein instead is bound on top of the thyroid receptor, retinoid, X receptor, heterodimer, now this will actually do whatever it's going to do to the expression of the downstream gene, whether it's to promote the expression of the downstream gene or repress the expression of the downstream gene. Okay, so to summarize then, normally these genes which are going to have their expression influenced by the presence of T3 and T4 they will have, up in their gene control regions, a thyroid response element, which is this specific sequence of usually between 8 to 10 uh, nucleic acids. And I wish now that I knew the actual sequence and how long it was, so that I didn't have to say this, but I don't know the specific sequence for uh, the thyroid receptor with retinoid X receptor, but there will be some specific sequence which is called the thyroid response element, and I imagine that it will be between 8 and 10 amino acids. Uh, because generally these hormone response elements are, and I've said amino acids again, it will usually be between 8 and 10 nucleic acids because usually these hormone response elements are between 8 and 10 nucleic acids. Okay, so um, all of these genes that are going to have their effect their expression influenced then by T3 and T4 will have a thyroid response element in the gene control region upstream of them and this will usually have the thyroid receptor, retinoid, X receptor, heterodimer uh, bound to it. However, it won't actually be having an effect on the expression of the downstream gene because without the thyroid hormones bound to the thyroid receptor, what happens is a co-repressor binds on top and then stops this from actually influencing the gene expression of the downstream gene. Once the T3 and T4 actually arrive in the cell, they bind to the thyroid receptor. That causes the co-repressor to break off. The co-activator then replaces it, so get rid of that pink blob, put on a blue blob instead. And now that you've got the thyroid receptor, retinoid X receptor with a co-activator, uh, that is now going to have an effect on the expression of the downstream gene. and. Therefore, all of these genes with the thyroid response element in their gene control regions, they're going to now have their expression changed by the presence of the T3 and T4 uh, hormones. Oh. Okay, so that then is the pathway by which T3 and T4 elicit changes in the behavior of cells. They change gene expression within cells, and of course if you change gene expression, you can hugely change the behavior of the cell. Okay, so that's the in-detail molecular uh, biology. Let's now zoom back out and talk on a more systems level what are the effects of T3 and T4 around the body.